after three months in Mongolia, I'm saying goodbye. And maybe I'll be able to get back again. So my last kind of view of Ulaanbaatar and the center of downtown in the distance. I'm going to move over, but you can see the Genghis Khan statue way in the distance of apartment buildings. And may I, get I did make it back to Ulaanbaatar. So let's start with our predator on a motorcycle as we continue our walk over to the new Genghis Khan Museum. I just finished a really quick tour of the new Genghis Khan Museum that just opened in Ulaanbaatar. So I wanted to get my first impressions. I didn't have a lot of time today. And I normally tell you that it could take you up to six hours to tour it. And I have no doubt it could take that long with interpretation. But um, then unfortunately, they don't allow photos or videos to be taken in the museum floors. And they have three to four attendance on minimum on each floor in security, so there's definitely no way to get any official uh, photos or videos right now, so I'm going to give you my first impressions and give you some first-hand accounts. This is one impressive museum. You're talking, uh, I toured eight floors very quickly. Everything is, um, is under heavy security. This place is extremely busy. A lot of the school children are in. And I got no doubt this museum is going to inspire the Mongolian, uh, give them a lot of pride in their history and culture. Now, we know that um, officially Genghis Khan's tomb has never been found. And that'll be for another story another day. And But prior to his empire, uh, he has taken over in 1206 and and bringing together the Mongol Empire. Prior to him, there was the uh, 9th century, we had the Khitan Empire out west, and I had the opportunity to go visit some of the areas where the Khitan Empire existed for a couple hundred years in the 9th century. And there's one small stone tower about 15, 20 meters high, and that's all that's left in that area. And that, that itself took me two hours to get to from Chobasan, but fast forward when that empire ended, um, you had Chinggis Khan bring all the Mughals together in 1206 and subsequently most of the um, lineage of the Khans lasted in about the early 1600s and they've got the complete lineage of all the uh, Khans since the um, 12th century all the way through to the 16th century. So let me give you kind of an overview. Again, I mentioned it is extremely um, impressive. The artifacts, the displays, the interaction, um, the maps, all in different uh, languages. Um, I'm going to try to collect my thoughts and give you a really good idea that what I saw. They had dozens and dozens of artifacts. I'm just laughing at myself. I'm looking at looking. I just I just beat the wave of all the. Uh, School kids coming in because, again, they're letting the schools out to uh, tour the museum. So, again, I saw the 12th and 13th century uh, artifacts of all the um, arrows, the original bows, uh, the swords. It was just it was just so impressive. I don't even want to be able to talk to you on this thing. Uh, but what amazed me was that they had some of the original... Um, powerful Mongolian bow, uh, bows that they used, uh, which, you know, created their empire, which stretched all the way from Korea to China, all the way to the borders of Hungary, to uh, the borders of um, um, the Arabian Sea. And it's just impressive. And the center of all that uh, was Karakorum. At one time, this, you know, capital center of the world. It's about five hours from Ulaanbaatar, um, and I haven't had a chance to get to it this trip, but I'm going to make a point on my next trip to get to Karakoram. I have to go see the old capital of uh, Mongolia. Not much left, I know, but there's still enough of the remnants <coughs> so that you can get an understanding 
just how vast this empire was and how they ruled it. Um, I thought I was impressed with the Mongolian Empire. This, this museum will no doubt just garner so much pride in their culture that uh, the Mongolians are going to be looking ahead to a very bright future. What I saw also in, in terms of culture and politics, they were extremely adept at forming relationships across the uh, across their entire empire. Uh, new forms of money, literacy, uh, script writing, tolerance for religions. But on the other hand, I have to recognize that a thousand years ago it was brutal, and that was the way of the world. But that's how they uh, that's how they conquered most of the known world at the time. But now we fast forward and we get to see, you know, how the um, how they actually waged war. I didn't realize that they had um, siege machines. They had catapults and they had trebuchets. Um, probably came in about 15th century. They even had the old kind of English style blunderbuss. Uh, the guns. I saw some uh, mounted, uh, large kind of blunderbuss type of uh, guns mounted on saddles that they used. Very inventive. So culture, war, diplomacy, no doubt you can see why they were able to uh, conquer the world at the time. So as I finish my first impressions, I'm going to try to find some footage somewhere to include with my video today and my talk. <clears throat> and I apologize, I can't get any videos or photos in there, it's just too much security, but when I leave here and get the outside, I'll take another uh, view of the Jigas Khan, and I hope you enjoyed my impression today, and when I get back, I'm going to take another tour and spend as much time as I can. As I leave the Chinggis Khan Museum and gather my thoughts and had shared them with you as best I could, this is the closest I'm going to get to doing any filming at the front of the Chinggis Khan, so I thought I'd give you some last glimpses of a lot of the local population going into the museum, and uh, like again, I can't, I can't begin to tell you how impressive this building is. All right, everybody have a good Passing the Chinggis Khan statue, one of the largest equestrian statues in the world. We'll head off to Zoom On and the museum. I'm at the Buddhist temple outside of Zoom On by about six kilometers. It's probably about nine minus 15. Now this area of outside Zuman held one of the biggest monasteries in Mongolia up until about 1936. It was established about late 1700s and it had over a thousand monks that lived up here. And at least 25 to 30 different type of monasteries, small ones. And during 1939, or before that, 37, the communist rules came in and of course killed many of the monks and destroyed all the Buddhist temples. So very little left at the top of the hill is a is the last left of the Buddhist temple that hasn't been restored yet. But you can see the terrain right now on December the 5th outside Zuman, Mongolia. All the temples were razed to the ground. The monks were killed and everything was scattered and started getting restored probably about the uh, 1990s when Mongolia became a democracy and and started reestablishing. Now it's an area for families. And there's no tourists out through this time of year, but uh, you get an idea what this area was like. The gates to Chinggis Khan city and the region of the first base of Chinggis Khan. Closing in the governor's gear, the portrait over my left hand side is Chinggis Khan. I did a video on the Mansur Buddhist temple in the area. It's about five kilometers from here. Here's a layout. At one time it housed about a thousand Buddhist monks and probably about 40 or 50 smaller temples, but it got destroyed in 1938-39 during the purges with the Mongolian communists, unfortunately. Continue our trip to Sabata province and Bernard, and we're going to check out one of the monasteries.
We're coming up to the heart of the community as we're heading toward the downtown core. And it's a very active Buddhist temple. And I'll get a closer view. But as we go by, the town has erected a number of statues throughout there representing the various animals in the region. So let's take a little tour of this Buddhist temple. I'm not able to get inside today because I was, should ask permission before I go in. And it's probably a Saturday service today. Uto, the project officer from Merritt, will be joining me to give me a tour of one of the museums that we're going through. In the meantime, we're looking at the 10,000 names of the monks that were killed in 1939 during the communist coup. Yeah, this hall is a kind of cultural uh, room and all these portraits and pictures are uh, the actress, actors and singers, all the famous people who are originally from the Dongobi province. Now, and then you know about the traditional Mongolian long song, long right? Song. So uh, this this singer is the most famous, famous singer in the Mongolian history. She, um, she, her talent was recognized not only in Mongolia, uh, across the country, I mean in Japan and in other Western countries. Now Uto, I do know a little bit about you, that you are an exceptional singer too, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I've heard your voice before, so it's a very good one. Now what's and the history? You know, this um, music, musical instrument. It's, is is it a, called the horse head fiddle? Yes, is that what it's called? Head and what's fiddle. the um, what's the historical uh -huh. significance of the horse head yeah. fiddle? Yeah, oh, the why it's called the horse head fiddle is that all these strings are made of the horse's tail hair, and it has only two strings, but it makes a beautiful sound. Yeah. And this portrait up here? Uh, he, I think it's a portrait from one of the actors. Yeah, this, this is the traditional dwelling of Mongolia, which is called Gir. So uh, Mongolians have been using this traditional, clo uh, traditional dwelling for uh, thousands of years because we are the nomadic um, people and then this traditional uh, dwelling is really uh, easy to um, uh, to collapse and to rebuild it takes only like two hours to build this gear so it's uh, that's why we are we have been using it for centuries it's very um, now you did say this is an actual. <laughs> yes, this is an act. This was an actual gear, uh, where the one of the uh, this uh, very famous uh, monk used to live. Hidden in the back there, it looks like a uh, a Bactrian camel that's been put away. For, it's not displayed yet. Is it, do you think is that a real one that's been stuffed? Stuffed, I think so. Yeah. Wow. So we've got a. Stuff bathroom camel, but with the aesthetic monk's clothing and his former gear. As we continue, we're yeah, all, all, all. Can you tell me some of the animals that are in here? So the um, can you see this? Some of the. Uh, the bigger one with the big horns. Big they horns. are the Siberian ibex. 
Ibex. Genus Siberian ibex. Yeah. So these uh, types of the Siberian ibex live in some of the mount, in, uh, rocky mountains of the Bungobi provinces. That uh, province, yeah. And these are some types of the foxes and. It looks like yeah. marmots. Yeah, marmots. Yeah, marmots and rabbits. And, and on this side, we've got. The birds, the hawks. So these are the meteorites that were discovered in the Dungobis territory. And now it's really rare and, uh, as Will say, it's really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is unusual to, have, to see the type of collection they have here of, of these meteorites they find. And on this next panel here, are they, this is are this part of the petrified, petrified wood area. Mm -hmm. They found the gobi. Yeah. It's not entirely my favorite part, but it's part of the history back in the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties with the. Communist regimes and then the Soviet Union rules, and uh, still part of the history that they have to acknowledge. Great military artifacts, and of course, many of the local Mongolian rulers at the time in the 20s. Progression up until 30s and 40s. And then from the communists into the Soviet rules into the uh, late 80s until the end of the communist period in 1990 when Mongolia became a full democracy. And you can still see all the influences of the Soviet images. This section, of course, has to do more with the gear and the house crutch, which I've been experiencing since my times in Mongolia. And, and again, these artifacts are going back well over 100 years. And uh, if you look at the skin where they took out the Arig milk from, which I just had some the other day, it's a tradition that hasn't been lost. These ankle bones are from the sheep and goat, uh, both ankle, and uh, this, uh, these bones are used as a traditional game. So the Mongolian children uh, play using these bones with varieties of the different types of games. This is the bone games. Mm -hmm. Does that, okay, my mis that looks like a, a crossbow on the wall here. Anchor bone shoot. This is the tools. And so what's that one on the wall here? Oh, it's a... Yeah, this is... Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> it, no, it just looks like a crossbow. I was just looking yeah, at it. Maybe but... put the ankle in the, at the top and then shoot using this tool. Oh. Yeah. That's fascinating what they're doing. So it looks like chess games are here. They made. Yeah. Some types of the board games. And what's this here? Just, is it of young yeah. boys? Uh, if you see this, you can see the three sports of the Nadam Festival. Nadam Festival and then wrestling, uh, archery and the horse racing. These are the main uh, typical sports game of the Nanta. and this is the clothes for the um, uh, for the children who um, who ride the racing horse. Oh, in the Nandan Festival. Yeah. Now I, under children. I understand the children are seven to thirteen that ride it yeah, now. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the um, wrestlers' oh, clothing. The wrestlers' clothing. Yeah. Do you know the reason why the chest is open? No. Because there is an, uh, there is a history that in ancient 
times it was only uh, for dedicated for the men and then uh, but one day one uh, girl who uh, hid herself with the cloth and then he, uh, he and then she attended the wrestling competition and then she won and then since that oh, time she disguised herself yeah uh -huh. and then okay. since that time it became like open open armed <laughs> okay and this is the um archery the archery yeah I'm... bow and arrow Okay, there's the traditional tea sets and the and the bowls that we've been eating out of the garris. Mm -hmm. I was kind of amazed that they're, they're very expensive. Mongolia has over 20 different ethnic groups and then majority of the ethnic groups are called uh, Hakh and this is the um, common cloth for that um, ethnic group and if you go to this Batar and Dharma provinces you can see more different uh, ethnic groups there so the, most of the people in Dungabi are from that majority of the ethnic groups and all these clothes and the accessories and tools are related to that um, tradition of that ethnic groups. And this, the significance of this, well, I don't even call it a massive, is it for <laughs> massive pot? Yeah. Is it for cooking? Is it like an oil or milk based for um, cooking? Maybe for cooking. Yeah, it's. Yeah, that's huge. I remember some of the gears that we've been visiting that these particular serving. Do you know that um, the film, Hollywood film called Star Wars, right? Yes. So <laughs> Star oh. Wars got an idea of these oh, traditional clothes of the Mongolian women, noble women. <laughs> so, Uta, just show me on that. Show me up again. So the Star Wars. Oh, I can yeah. see it now. <laughs> yeah, you can recognize. Oh, I can recognize it now. The Princess Leia. Yeah. Oh, that was that's very interesting. Glad you brought that one up. <laughs> this display has a lot of the musical instruments, and look at the size of that instrument, trumpet instrument. Again, going back over a thousand years. Now, this particular artifact looks like some sort of altar stone that they were uh, that they were using. And take a look at this old bell. And I'll check on the age of this of this classical bell period, um, Yang Chen Jun period. I haven't got the exact date, but we're talking a couple thousand years. And again, the implements that they have found in this region. So this rock painting is related to the um, uh, third century before uh, BC, BC. Right? BC, yeah, and then uh, there was an um, a performance, dance performance. Uh, in the UN headquarter in 2020, uh, showing this dance, get an idea from this rock painting. Oh, does that, it make sense? That is, it mm -hmm. does. That's very good. Thank you. Yeah, and the Mongolian uh, dancers show um, show this. 
show it in the UN headquarters. Another rock painting. It looks extremely old. Yeah, but these two are the replicas. Okay. Okay. Ufil, this one, this rock fascinates me because it's got a symbol. That I means it's very close to the the old German symbol. But I know it's a symbol <laughs> of life. Yeah, but it's, this is, it is a swastika, but it's a symbol of life. You know, mm -hmm. it looks. Am I mistaken? Is that fifteen hundred years old? Thousand years old? Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So it goes back. You know, I remember it was a symbol of life. So Mongolian Gobi is really famous for the findings of the ancient dinosaurs. And then, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, early um, uh, the 1901 and 19, between 1901, uh, the group of American expeditions firstly visited um, Mongolia to explore, to do some um, expedition to, um, uh, and then they uh, first they found the very first dinosaur egg from the Mongolian Gobi. Uh, the land was called, uh, is called the Flaming Cliffs, and then they found the, the dinosaur egg and then this finding proved uh, that the dinosaurs laid an egg for the first time in the world so this was the very I mean that, that historical was a, finding a very in this historical place. find yeah and uh, these these rock carvings over here yeah this a uh, rock a uh, rock how do you say that rock, um, carving yeah these are really also popular, I mean, come uh, popular in Mongolia. So in the very ancient times, like the, in the first century, there was a, a big empire called Shunnu. This, is, this empire was, uh, existed before the Mongolian, Mongol empire and then direct ancestors of the Mongolians. And then uh, uh, during the first century, during the Shunnu, empire when the noblemen when the king and queen pass away their i mean servants uh, servants were also uh, sacrificed sacrificed yes yeah, sacrificed the and then and then later on some centuries later uh during the um uh, to, uh, uh, during the uh, seventh century this tradition uh, gets a little bit changed because they um, they use this kind of rock uh, uh, rocks uh, rather than the uh, people, you know. <laughs> and there's the there's the dinosaur egg oh, that yeah. you were talking about. Yeah. yeah. There it is, right there. Okay, we'll get the other one now. I'll end with a statue of Lenin. Four or five kilometers from the city of Chobosan in eastern Mongolia, as a reminder of the old Soviet-style rule and what happens to empires. So please like and subscribe, and we'll see you again.